It's a pleasure and honor to be joined again by Dr. Ed Hagen. He is a professor of evolutionary anthropology at Washington State University. And Ed was one of the early guests on the Nature and Nurture podcast over two years ago and almost 100 episodes again. Ed, welcome back. Glad to be here. You gave a great overview of anthropology as a whole and particularly evolutionary biological anthropology when we first chatted. So I encourage listeners to check that out. And with that baseline knowledge, we can talk about the recent scandal in anthropology. This happened, we booked this podcast before this happened, but in the last week, some stuff has stirred up. Do you want to talk about that? Do I want to? No. Am I willing to? Yes. Um, and I am not a participant in any of this stuff on the inside. So I don't have any inside information on anything. I only know what I've seen on Twitter and what uh, my association, it's actually not my association, but the American Anthropology Association has published on their website and the various responses. And apparently, according to my understanding, there was a session. So academic organizations typically hold these annual meetings and they have typically dozens of sessions. Some of them are invited. Some of them are put together ad hoc, individual talks. And there was a session on the utility in the anthropology of, and the analytical utility of biological binary sex, males and females. And for the general audience, this may seem like, duh, but within certain corners of academia, it's become hotly debated is a binary sex really scientifically the best approach. And of course, these issues have come to the fore with our increasing awareness of issues of transgender individuals and should they be able to participate in sports activities that are typically have been segregated by a success, sex, excuse me. And I shouldn't state from the outset, I'm not an expert on any of these things. And this doesn't really intersect areas of my research at all. So. I'm an outsider to all this looking in. Between the two of us, we might have some shared expertise, or at least this issue seems to be right at the middle. So I know that we haven't spoken in two years. I don't know if you know what I'm up to, but we met when I was an undergrad. And since then, I've started my PhD in psychology, particularly developmental psychology. So I've been studying puberty and brain development and hormones, as there are a lot of sex differences involved in that. And I'm interested in part in taking an evolutionary approach and a cross-species approach of understanding what sex differences emerge during puberty and how they might be relevant directly or indirectly to sexual selection. So specifically, we're looking at reward sensitivity and brain development and risk-taking during adolescence and beginning around puberty, risk-taking shoots up in males. And one of the reasons for that although there are many sociological and biological testosterone is associated with reward sensitivity. Testosterone increases dopamine output in the brain and males during this age tend to be more impulsive and that might in part be due to these hormonal changes. So that's one of the things I've been studying. And before that, I was working at USC. This was, we met and did the podcast, I think before I got involved in this line of research, but I was working with Megan Herting and the med school. And I was working on brain development in an intersex population called congenital adrenal hyperplasia. So this is the most common intersex disorder there is. It's when females are exposed to excess prenatal androgens in the womb. Most of the time it's treated shortly after birth. So they don't go full on intersex in the sense of having ambiguous genitalia or anything like that. But there are subtle virilizing effects on brain development prenatally. So these girls tend to be more aggressive, more tomboyish during childhood. They're more likely to grow up to be gay, which is interesting. So there's some prenatal hormone effect of sexuality there. And anyway, at the time, I didn't see all of this as connected to the evolutionary psychology interest, to this anthropology cultural issue we're talking about. But now looking back, I feel dragged into it as well. Clearly, you're more of an expert on many of these issues than I am. Is the prevalence of that condition, is that 1% to 2%? Do I have that? 
I think so. Yeah. It, yeah. Right. Yeah, so more precise that. there. So prevalence of the condition in general, if you're lacking the enzyme to produce cortisol, which would give you the age, that's one to 2%. But to the extent of calling it intersex is much, much lower because it's more like 0.02% right, right. of the population that's genuinely intersex. Right? So to continue with the story here, the session, because many associations, scientific associations and journals, including nature journals, which are the top scientific journals in the world, some of them have begun to call into question the validity and utility of binary sex. So this session was aimed at arguing in favor of the utility of binary sex for anthropology. And it was accepted. It was reviewed. It was a reviewed session, which means that experts looked over the abstract and the titles of the talks, and they accepted the session to appear at the annual meeting. But then apparently the executive committee of the American Association um, of Anthropologists decided to revisit that decision and then decided to cancel the session rather abruptly and rather recently. And of course, that then generated a huge uproar. Is this just political correctness gone wild or is it a scientifically valid decision? And those arguments and disputes are still echoing around Twitter, which is where I hang out and, and maybe in other bases as well. So that's the story, I, a little bit more, I can provide a little more detail when I looked over the, so initially I was really upset and dismayed by that decision because I think this is a really important to debate, important debate to have. And we need to continue talking about those not suppressed discussion of this issue. And by the way, anthropology has long for, for decades had a distinction between sex and gender recognizing that in many cultures, there are more than two genders. And there's a very interesting sub-discipline in anthropology studying that, and that needs to really be distinguished from binary sex. But that important distinction is now being overshadowed with this new claim that even binary sex is invalid. So anyway, when I was initially dismayed by the decision, and I still am, but when I looked at the list of participants, one of them stood out to me as a very controversial figure in anthropology. She has weighed in on numerous controversial issues, always weighing in on the controversial side. So in anthropology, we have a very fraught relationship with Native American communities that has taken decades to begin to address all of the controversies that largely reside with uh, us uh, as anthropologists uh, really screwed up. Okay. And uh, there are laws in place. And again, I'm not an expert on any of these, but it's called NAGPRA. And it has to do with repatriating remains, biological remains, as well as grave goods and other kinds of artifacts to the Native American communities for them to decide what to do with them. And uh, that particular individual has really argued against that, which is fine. But it's an incredibly politically touchy issue that needs to be handled carefully if you want to argue against. And it's again, it's illegal. It's set a law at this point. Um, argue against meaning something like the museums get to keep the artifacts instead of returning them to the natives. Yeah, and, and that research can continue. And I think there is an argument to be made there. So there, there are, for example, my association, the American Association of Biological Anthropologists, Bruce Babbitt made a decision many years ago to repatriate the remains of Kennewick Man. And to repatriate, you have to have a clear connection between the artifacts or the remains and a particular recognized tribal group. And Kennewick Man is one of the oldest uh, skeletons found in the Americas, about 9,000 years old. And whereas Bruce Babbitt said, okay, we're going to return those remains, which are of immense scientific value to the native local. My association argued that there really wasn't any clear connection between these now 9,000 year old remains and modern groups. Now that could be debated, but my association actually put out a, an official position statement that NAGPRA really didn't apply here. And I hope I'm paraphrasing their statement correctly. So that shows that there are real debates and controversies that deserve discussion 
But this particular person really seems to be a kind of barging in and, and handling things in an insensitive way, in a way to kind of designed to stir up a lot of controversy. She's weighed in on race and genetic differences in race and intelligence. And now she's again weighing in on another touchy issue. So the fact that she was included on this panel suggested that regardless of the merits of whatever her arguments might be, the, the amount of controversy over her other positions that have nothing to do with binary sex would really overshadow the important discussion that does need to take place, in my view, about the analytical value of, of binary sex. So I, that, I think, might have been played more heavily into the decision of the AAA to cancel the session than they're willing to admit. And if that's true, I can I have a little bit more sympathy for their decision, although I think they should have, if that did play a role, they should have been honest about that rather than trying to claim that it was purely on scientific grounds because the science is not settled on this issue. So to strong man, the non-binary side, it does seem like intersex disorders like H, the one we were talking about, are an interesting case study here because if you ask most people to define sex or say is sex binary, most people presumably say yes. If you ask them why, they might just say men and women look different. They have different features. That's not really a biological explanation. And the ones who know more about biology, they might point to chromosomes, like it's XX or XY, and that determines your sex. And I didn't learn until I got involved in this hormones research in the last year that there are some rare disorders like complete androgen insensitivity syndrome, where you can be born XY male and the chromosome determines within the first six weeks of fetal development, whether the fetus develops testes or ovaries, and then the testes produce testosterone, the ovaries produce estrogen. But then from there, it's pretty much entirely hormones that leads to sex differentiation. So in these rare cases where you are an XY baby and your body can't process androgens properly, uh, the testes are producing testosterone, but there's nothing for them to bind to, you essentially develop as female. And then you might think this has got to be a child who grows up to be a girl for the rest of her life because she's, she doesn't have the testosterone to grow into a man, but she doesn't have ovaries. So how she's going to go through female puberty. And then it turns out the amount of estrogen that males produce is enough to go through female puberty in terms of breast growth and fat redistribution around the hips and all of that. They'll remain infertile for life, but because they don't have ovaries and generally they don't even find out that they're not a normal, healthy woman until they're like 15, 16, have never gotten their first period. You get checked out at the doctor. The reason you haven't gotten a period is because you don't have ovaries. Yeah. And these are exactly the kinds of issues that do need to be discussed. So you're absolutely right that there, it's not like there's settled science here. And so when we think about utility of the sex binary, does it really apply in this case? And would some other concept be more powerful in explaining all the facts that we want to explain? So I think what you just said is a good argument for not canceling sessions like this so that these kinds of conversations can take place. And if we just prevent that from happening, then we're not going to move the science forward. But what I would say is I think a lot, and my, this is my position on this issue currently, is that binary sex is about more than just classifying every living thing into one of two categories. In fact, it does not do that. It's a concept that is meant to unify a number of diff disparate phenomena that we see in a wide range of species. And it really starts with the fact that in a wide range of species, not all, uh, individual genomes are a combination of two parental genomes. Not three, not a spectrum of genomes, uh, not 19 genomes, but two genomes. And so the fact that our genomes, including human genomes, come from two parents, where did those two genomes, how did they get together? They came in two different cells. So the fact that these genomes from our two parents are carried in two cells has a lot of evolutionary consequences. And what we see over and over, again, not universally, but across a wide range of species, is that those two cells evolve very different morphologies. 
And this is typically referred to as anisogamy, that one is big and one is small, but there's other aspects of the morphology that are also often not always affected, such as the motility of the cells. And then the fact that two cells are different in size and isogamy then has evolutionary effects on the phenotypes. And again, what we see in many species, not all, is that we get distinct phenotypes developing from that fertilized egg to specialize in producing one of those cells or the other, sometimes in some species, both. And some of the traits, the phenotypic traits that we see developing, many of them are identical between what we would call the sexes, but some can diverge pretty sharply, as you just mentioned, driven by uh, hormonal signals during development. So the sex binary is not just about classifying the, the end product of that, the end phenotypes, which often can be pretty reliably put into one of two categories with some exceptions, as you just noticed, noted. But it's really meant to help unify and explain all of these phenomena. And we might not have realized that they all fit together in an interesting way. And it's, we still don't really understand everything about it. We don't understand why sexual reproduction evolved. We have a lot of theories about it. We have evidence, but we don't have any consensus. Why in many species um, are our genomes combinations of two parental genomes and not fewer, not why not one, why not more? There are theories about this, but it's a very interesting and pervasive phenomenon that if we jettison the binary biological sex, it would become much more difficult to explain, in my view. And so any concept that aims to replace binary sex have got to do a better job at unifying all of those phenomena, in my opinion. Yeah, understanding the evolution of sex differences, both behaviorally and phenotypically, was always pretty intuitive to me from that starting point of you have differential reproductive cost with eggs being much larger and more energetically expensive than sperm. But there's that question of why is that the starting place? Why do you have two different gamete types? And I heard one hypothesis about it, this red queen hypothesis, you have to go, you have to run as fast as you can just to remain in the same place. So this is talking about co-evolution or evolutionary pressures against pathogens. So if your genome is relatively stable, like it would if you're cloning yourself, then eventually a parasite could maybe just wipe you out. But then if every generation you're mixing up your genes 50-50 split, that originally evolved as a way of uh, staying ahead of parasites. Yeah, and that's my favorite hypothesis. There are many, and that's one of many hypotheses for the evolution of sex. And it's not obvious because sex is very costly. We really could have one male fertilizing just about every female. So every ejaculation has enough sperm to, human ejaculation has enough sperm to fertilize I mean, every woman on the planet. So you could have one male and all these females and all the resources that go into building those individuals, you could put them all into females. So why are we wasting this tremendous amount, why are organisms wasting this huge amount of investment to raise males? So this is called the twofold cost of sex. It's so what benefit could possibly outweigh that tremendous cost. And the theory that you just mentioned is the one that I favor, that we are in an arms race with pathogens. Pathogens typically evolve much more rapidly than the larger body of the organisms that they infect, not always. And because they're evolving very rapidly, it's very difficult for the host to then evolve defenses against them. And especially if you had pathogens that are transmitted from parent to offspring. So if the offspring were genetically identical to the parents, it would be much easier for those pathogens to then infect the offspring. And of course, as we just saw with uh, COVID, the uh, virus depends critically on the precise nature of the proteins in your respiratory tract in order to invade your cells and infect you. So if those proteins are a little bit different, it just becomes that much more difficult for the pathogen to infect you. So this is one of the leading hypotheses of the benefit of sexual reproduction that could outweigh the cost. And that is that the offspring are going to be less easily infected by pathogens that have adapted to their parents. And, and this just goes to show you how 
binary concept of sex is beginning to help us think about all of these big questions. Why does sex exist in the first place? I think that's the starting point. And then all of the downstream consequences of that. Another thing we saw with COVID is that over time, the variants evolved to be more transmissible, but less deadly. Because if you kill your host, then you can't continue to spread. So it seems like before sex may have evolved, you could argue, why wouldn't the pathogen, if the pathogens can completely take over the host and kill them, the pathogen's going to die alongside it. Wouldn't it make more sense for it? Like, what is the arms race there if it's in the pathogen's interest as well to not kill its host? Yeah, so the arms race there is, in order to reproduce, the pathogen needs to eat you, basically. So the more nutrients, the bigger chunk out of you it takes for its own use, the more copies of itself it can produce. But if it dies, and so that's virulence, the extent to which the pathogen is exploiting the host in order to reproduce itself. But in order to get from host A to host B, as you just mentioned, if the host A dies, um, it's going to be much harder for that pathogen, no matter how many copies of it there are in host A, to jump over to host B. There's a huge amount of research on these dynamics, um, the trade-off between transmissibility, which requires hosts to be mobile and move around, and virulence, which is the extent to which the pathogen can exploit the host. And what you just gave is the basic story, that there's a trade-off between those two. Theoretical work and also empirical work generally supports that, but there's a lot of complications and caveats and a lot of still research yet to be done. There's no guarantee that COVID was guaranteed to evolve to be less virulent, even though that seemed to be the uh, pattern initially. But we have lots of examples where that doesn't happen, and we have theoretical models where that doesn't happen. Um, so it's not totally clear. Uh, and the dynamics with infectious diseases become really complicated because with COVID, initially, nobody's been exposed, nobody's immune to it, so it spreads like wildfire. But then you get a lot of natural immunity in the population. And so then the dynamics for the pathogen change and the dynamics for the host change as the number of susceptible individuals, number of susceptible individuals in the population drop. And the dynamics of all that can get really complicated. Folks who study this, by, there's a chance that COVID will evolve to become less virulent. We've seen that in many cases, but we don't always see that. So let's not get complacent here. And the incentive for evolving in the opposite direction to become more severe, that might happen just if it allows it to eat you faster and multiply more quickly within the body. Yeah. And so then it depends, like if you can eat you faster and make more copies of itself, that in certain circumstances might be a better strategy for the pathogen than, than keeping you alive. So if it has a chance, if you have hosts that are interacting a lot with each other, the pathogen will be able to jump ship, as it were, as it were, before the host drops dead. So, there, and if there's a lot of vulnerable hosts in the population, it's going to be easier for the pathogen to, to jump ship to the next hosts. So a lot of the extent to which pathogens are either able to or unable to jump ship is one of the big factors. And what we saw in some of the earlier SARS, and again, I should really put the caveat here, this is not my area of expertise. But what we saw in some of the earlier, nevertheless, I'll make a comment. What we saw in some of the earlier SARS viruses that came out in the early 2000s is that people became very severely symptomatic right away. So it was easy to isolate them and prevent the spread of SARS-1. Whereas SARS-2, there was this, a lot of folks were asymptomatic and that made it much more difficult to contain SARS-2 compared to, to SARS-1. So that, it's all those kinds of things can play a role. A couple of years ago, we talked about some of your work on the evolution of substance use and that humans and other species will sometimes go out of their way to ingest toxins to kill pathogens inside them before it. The toxin is more harmful to the pathogen than it is to us in small doses, even though it's still harmful to us. Yeah, that's the, that's the hypothesis. Uh, we're still working on it. Excuse me, my cat is demanding attention here. <laughs> Sorry about that. And we see this in a lot of species. It's called self-medication or cognosy, animal knowledge of pharma pharmaceuticals. And so what we see in many species, it looks like self-medication behavior that 
animals are deliberately eating toxic plants that don't have high nutritional value. And it's not clear why they're doing it. And the emerging evidence seems to indicate that they're doing it exactly as you just said, that it's actually a form of medicine, that the toxicity in the plants is worse for the pathogens than it is for the animal we're eating them. And so we are applying that idea to human drug use. And we humans use a lot of drugs. And we, you might not think of it, but spices are basically similar to drugs. They're toxic plants that don't have much nutritional value. And yet we deliberately add them to our food. But why are we deliberately adding spices, plant tox toxic plant substances to food? A lot of pathogens are transmitted with food. And what the evidence shows is that we typically add those spices to meat dishes. And meat is a food substance that is particularly likely to have pathogens that might harm us. And the reason is we're eating mammals. And we are mammals. And so as we just talked about with the theory for the evolution of sex, parasites that have pathogens that have evolved to infect one mammal might easily spread to other mammals, and of course, that's what we think happened with SARS, that it jumped over into humans, from some other mammals, some bats or penguins or raccoon dogs or whatever your current zoonotic vector happens to be. This week, a number have been proposed. So when we eat mammals, we are potentially eating organisms that are already infected with pathogens that are in some sense pre-adapted to infect us. So adding spices to meat might kill those pathogens before uh, we eat them. And we use a lot of other drugs. We use alcohol and tobacco and coffee and cannabis and cocaine. And all of these are plant toxins which kill pathogens. So we're also working on the hypothesis that maybe human use of these recreational drugs this could also be a self-medication strategy that we like them because we have a taste for them. And they make us feel good precisely because they have a medicinal value. The meat eating take is really interesting because some of my friends think that I'm weird. I like to eat rice and vegetables very plain, but I season meat quite heavily. And now I can make the case, this is the evolutionarily adopted strategy here. Yeah, absolutely. And my wife is the same way. <laughs> she's a, a big vegetable eater, but whenever she eats meat, she's just dousing it with um, spicy stuff. And I think that is the really strong hypothesis for the reason that, and, we, and research does show that when we look at recipes, it's typically meat dishes that have the most spices in them across cultures. So that's some of the evidence uh, in favor of it. It's always worth pointing out that these are still hypotheses that are being tested and not proven yet. But I think that's one of the strongest hypotheses out there right now. Last time we also talked about how Children have sweet tooths because during development, you need a lot of energy and because they're, they like bitter foods less like vegetables or especially things like coffee or maybe even nicotine uh, because it, their immune systems aren't fully developed yet. Uh, now, the flip side to that would be once you develop a, a stronger immune system, you want to take more of that? Is it that it's an actual craving that develops or is it more just you can handle it so you start to because everyone around you is doing it. It's more like a social learning thing. What we think and, and what you're raising here, what we see very clearly is that kids don't use drugs. They don't like spices. They don't like spicy food. They don't even like green leafy vegetables. We all know getting your kids to eat your, their vegetables is a of a job. And they also don't use recreational drugs at all. There's almost no tobacco use, alcohol use. Coffee, even coffee use is really rare in kids under the age of 10. And our hypothesis of it, to the standard story is it's all social learning. Your parents don't want you to use these things and kids are perfectly well behaved. And so they do exactly what their parents tell them to. And a lot of people buy that story. I don't, having raised two daughters that are always sneaking into the candy jar and cookie jar, even though I tell them not to, things that they actually like, sugar, sugary foods, it's really hard to get kids to not eat those. 
And the standard story for drugs is that drugs are just like sugar. They trigger dopamine. You mentioned that at the beginning here. And so our brain mistakes tobacco for sugar. And that's why we like tobacco. That's the standard dopamine model. Or if that were true, kids would like tobacco and coffee just as much as and alcohol, just as much as adults do. And it would be just as hard to prevent them from using those substances as it is to prevent them from eating all their Halloween candy uh, in two days. Um, and yet we don't see that. The evidence is overwhelming that the use of these um, recreational drugs is, is just... And the reason is we think what we're proposing is that kids are undergoing very rapid brain development and the development of other tissues as well. And plant toxins, these plant toxins evolve to interfere with our nervous system. That's how they kill a lot of pathogens that have nervous systems, like other worms and other things, insects that eat plants. So the last thing you'd want to do if you are, if your nervous system is developing at a very rapid pace is consuming substances that interfere with neural signaling, thereby disrupting neural development. So our take, and we have quite a bit of evidence for this, is that situations where you would want to avoid substances that can disrupt brain development are exactly the situations where we're going to see people not using drugs. And so in children and women of reproductive age use fewer drugs than men of reproductive age. When they're pregnant, their use drops even lower. And then interestingly, after menopause, women's drug use uh, bumps up uh, much closer to men's drug use. Um, and the reason we think is that women are not trying to protect the development of their own nervous systems, which are all completely developed, but instead to protect the potential fetuses that they either might be carrying if they're pregnant or if they get pregnant, they don't want a lot of these substances in their system. So we call this kind of the, the fetal protection hypothesis that, that women are using fewer plant toxic substances than, than others. And so yes, when you hit adolescence, your brain is almost fully developed, at least in physical size, and a lot of development's already in place. And so now the potential benefits of self-medication outweigh the cost of disrupted brain development once, once you hit um, adolescence. And that's exactly what we see from we have age 10 to 20. Everyone will transition from essentially zero drug use to drug use, be it coffee or tobacco or alcohol or some other drug. You know what I'm thinking, given what I told you about my research earlier? What? Puberty. And if it starts at age 10, that has me think this might be more of an adrenarchy effect than a gonadarchy. So the first phase of puberty, driven more so by adrenal androgens like DHEA, and then only later do you start to see gonadal sex steroid hormones like testosterone and estrogen really take over. Do you know if there's any role of, of DHEA or other sex hormones? Yeah, that's a great question. I should have thought of that myself. So now I have to invite you on a paper if I do that. I'd be happy That'd to be do cool. that. Yes. Uh, that's a great idea. I do have a former student that works on that, exactly on that topic. So I should ask her about that. I should have thought of that. But yeah. On puberty and on taste preferences as they develop? Not on taste preferences, but on DHEA and the role of that in what we call, I forget the exact terminology she uses, but humans have this kind of middle stage of childhood that we think is driven by that particular hormone and, and that's what she's developed methods for detecting that in the hair mm -hmm. so that we can do these studies in rural populations where it's more difficult to do the other kinds of studies we might normally do on those hormones so she gets hair samples in kind of rural population subsistence populations um, hunter gatherers and things like that with uh, kids to look at the extent to which um, this hormone is is driving different changes in social behavior and other kinds of behaviors. We haven't looked at drug use yet. That's a good idea. My PhD work has been on human connectome project, which is a very large, diverse sample here. And I've been mostly working with saliva hormones so far, but we do have a hair sample that's currently being analyzed. The data looks really messy. And I was talking to someone from the med school here who suggested that one of the reasons it might look messy is because the diversity of our sample, which is normally a big strength to counter weird biases that you see in, right. in psychology research often, that could backfire here because the assay techniques were developed primarily on Caucasians with a certain hair type. And the more diverse the sample gets, the lower your data quality gets, unless you're able to calibrate for that. 
So if these are from cross-cultural comparisons, how does that work with the hair data? Yeah, that would be a question for uh, Courtney, not for me. But she, I think, did the validation in the populations that she's working with. And that was mm -hmm. a big part of her dissertation. And she had three different popula African populations, as I recall. And I do think a big part of, the, of her research was precisely doing those validation studies in those different populations for the reasons mm -hmm. that you mentioned. But I honestly right. don't remember. So valid within the population, but no, yeah. might not necessarily generalize to others. Exactly. But what happens when you have the opposite case? So we're talking about, it makes evolutionary sense that children won't have a taste for bitter foods, but it also makes sense that you would develop this preference later on. But sometimes you get adults who are just lifelong picky eaters, adults who act like children. And normally I think people look at that as, okay, they were just raised wrong. They never learned to eat their vegetables and they're a child at heart. Could there be something biological going on there? Yeah, and I mentioned some of it already, which is if you're a male versus female, and if you're in different reproductive phases, so are you in the reproductive years from roughly adolescence to your late 30s, or are you postmenopause? I don't present, believe that I mean, men have less vegetables than women. If anything, the stereotype, I feel like there's a stereotype of it going in the opposite direction, even though I'm not sure where I'm getting that from. Yeah, you mean men eating more vegetables or? Men, men eating like, fewer vegetables, although men, men eating, they have the higher tolerance to these bitter plant toxins. Yeah, I don't know the, actually the data on um, spicy foods. My, my sense is that, and I'm pretty sure there are studies backing this up, that males use more spices than females, but I'm not I sure. Think, I think so too. I've, I've heard that normally interpreted in more like a male ego thing. It's like status competition. If you're talking about spicy in the hot sense, more so than in the spices sense. Yeah. Do I, but I don't know all, all that. We've looked mostly at sex differences and age differences in tobacco use primarily is what we've really focused on, but then also coffee and alcohol. And so for tobacco and coffee in particular, I can state clearly that males are using them more than females. We have very clear evidence that when females might be exposing potentially exposing fetuses, their fetuses or their young children. In fact, one of what we see one of the biggest protective factors against tobacco use in women is having young kids in the household. And the younger the kids, the more protective it is. So women seem to be avoiding tobacco anyway when there are young kids around. But when it comes to spicy foods, I don't know the data there as well. You're right though, the Unfortunately, when you look at the, the data on picky eaters and stuff, it's, it's really from the perspective that this is a problem that kids are being dumb and bad and that we need to teach them to eat the, their vegetables. And there's relatively rare considerations that there might be evolutionarily good reasons why kids don't like their... And that makes it somewhat difficult to interpret the, the data from those studies. But they do, they really do emphasize if you expose kids to a more variety of foods, does that increase their willingness to have a more diverse diet? And it does seem to do that. So it does seem like there is a, a learning or calibration component here. And maybe that explains some of the adult variability that you brought up at the beginning there, that adults who remain picky eaters may not have had exposure to as diverse diets as others, that, that seems to be a reasonable hypothesis to me. But I don't know if there's evidence to support that or not. For myself, and I think for a lot of people in their early 20s, you do eventually adopt the healthier eating habits that you might not have listened to your parents tell you as a child. But it seems to be through learning the hard way, essentially. So now you have all the freedom in the world to have dessert for dinner or drink too much or to eat junk food all day. And then you feel like shit. <laughs> yeah. And then sometimes I actually crave vegetables now in a way like my body just feels bleh. If I get greens in me, I feel better. And I never had that as a child. Yeah. And I do think there's a problem. There's a lot we still have to learn about the developmental trajectories, including in middle age and older age uh, diet. And our body, over our evolution, it's, it's probably true that the kinds of 
of food sources that were available to us varied a lot. And we couldn't necessarily predict what environment we were going to be in, in, in terms of the foods and plant foods and animal foods that would be available. And it's even possible that there was enough variation that our environments were different than our parents' environments. Environments can change pretty quickly. And during the Pleistocene, they may have been changing particularly quickly. When we look at climate records during the Pleistocene, the pattern that really jumps out is one of climate variation. So what's the time the, period there that you're observing? The Pleistocene starts about two and a half million, 2.6 million years ago, and it ends about 10,000 years ago. So this is the period when our brains went from basically chimp-sized and then tripled to modern human size over that two and a half million year period. And so when we think about the evolution of kind of uniquely human cognitive trait, this is the time period that we should really focus on because this is when we see this dramatic increase in brain size. And it's happening in Africa. It's happening in Pleistocene, Ice Age, Africa. Um, and even though hominins did disperse uh, into the old world, um, there's pretty good evidence that the human lineage, just modern humans, were evolving in Africa and that our lineage was in Africa until shortly after, sometime after about 100,000 years ago. So the vast majority of this brain expansion occurs during the Pleistocene in Africa. And the environments that we're probably having to deal with are probably pretty varied. So learning the local foods, if you happen to not like some bitter plant that is the main source of nutrients, you're not going to be doing too well. And I've worked with Aka hunter-gatherers in the Congo Basin. And one of their staple plant foods, to me, just tasted like eating lawn mower or lawn mowing lawn. It was just like cut grass from your lawn. It just was horrible. And they eat tons of this stuff, and I could barely stomach it. So that's just an example of how you are going to adapt to the kinds of foods that are available in your local environment. The other thing they eat a lot of is caterpillars. And they're full of fat and protein and are a delicacy. And there's a caterpillar season where everybody goes out in the forest and spends a few weeks out there collecting caterpillars. So just again, an example of how we adapt to the foods that are available in our local environment. And are so this any... means that, just to finish up the thought here, that when we see variability in folks that we know in our own lives, their childhood diets might have been quite different than ours, potentially. Are there any Western foods that you brought over there that hunter-gatherers thought were gross? Yeah, did we typically, it's very expensive to bring foods over. So we buy uh, most of our foods locally, so tons of beans and tons of rice. And then we buy a lot of foods from the locals. We're bringing in forest antelope was one of the main meat sources. So we bought a lot of forest antelope from them for our dinners. So we're eating foods that are pretty local most of the time. And, and the only sort of Western foods that we bring, and of course, rice and beans are pretty popular everywhere, but we bring some candy bars and power bars and things like that. But of course, those are, everybody loves those because they're sugary and sweet. The one thing that's, that I screwed up, and this wasn't with the Aka, but it was with our, one of our research assistants who is an Agnandu guy. And this was really dumb of me, but in the capital city, they actually had an ice cream shop and I, and that's really expensive. So not too many people go there, but I thought, oh, I'll treat my research assistant to some ice cream. I don't know if he's ever had it before because I think he had not. But what I forgot is ice cream is of course full of milk and most people can't digest. Most adults oh. can't digest. And so I wasn't thinking about that. And I think out of politeness, he ate the ice cream, but then he did it. Get a pretty bad stomach ache. So that's one Western food. Even though it was being sold in uh, Bangui, the capital city of the Central African Republic, it's not a food that most of the locals would actually enjoy consuming. Do you know anything about how lactose tolerance actually evolved in the populations that it did? Yes. Yeah, so the leading theory is evolved in multiple populations that are relatively distantly related to each other or unrelated to each other, basically. And what we see in each of the populations where it did evolve is that they are dairying populations. So it looks like populations that are relying heavily on dairy products 
are the ones that have evolved the ability to digest lactose, which is milk sugar, as adults. We all can digest it as kids, as infants, because we're nursing. And so we need to be able to digest lactose. And we have a special, we all have a special enzyme. In fact, all mammals have this enzyme lactase, which allows us to digest that sugar. And then when we wean, we, our body turns that off because producing the enzyme when you're no longer going to be drinking milk doesn't do you any good. But in some populations, there's a mutation in that gene, actually, I mean, uh, what's called the promoter region of the gene that basically breaks that switch. And so in some population, it doesn't turn off. Now, the leading theory for years and years was the one that I just said that, oh, it must be the milk is, is uh, the major nutrition that these folks are needing. And so that mutation spread in those populations. And that's still, I think, a, a leading contender. But now that we have some ancient DNA and we can begin to actually trace when, exactly when particular version of the lactase gene began to spread in Europe. And it's also, we see it in Saudi Arabia and some African populations as well. It's not exactly the same mutation, but it has the same effect, essentially. The timing doesn't exactly line up with the archaeology of the transition to a more daring thing. So folks are beginning to wonder if we have the right explanation or not. And I, I would say the jury is still out on that. Because it seems a bit circular if there's going to be a selection pressure for populations that were eating it, but you can't eat it until you have the mutation that allows you to yeah. digest it. Yeah. And what we see is that a lot of populations then would use uh, things like yogurts and cheeses where the sugars have already been converted by microorganisms into products that we can digest. So when we look at these kind of fermented products, then we can use it. We could, so that's actually part of the new story is that these populations were perfectly capable of using milk for food, but they would often use it in the forms of cheeses and yogurts. And, and so the story is getting a little bit more complicated and it could still end up being something about that, but it, we now think it may be, or at least some folks think that are really digging into this, that there may be some interaction with epidemics and plagues and other factors that had kind of some kind of interaction with these dairy and cultures that then led to the rise of what's called lactase persistence, persistence of expression of the lactase gene. It's about all I know on that one. Look, back to the Pleistocene, the time period in which our brains tripled in size. I know there are a whole bunch of theories for this. One is just our diets changed. We started eating meat and eventually we learned how to cook. So all those extra calories could go to your brain. And that one makes sense, except it seems like it only, even though it, you do have extra energy and it could go to your brain and being smarter could be adaptive. We were surviving for millions of years with chimp level brain power. So that itself doesn't seem to be an inherent selection pressure unless either A, the environment changes such that only the smarter ones are surviving or B, sexual selection. But Jeffrey Miller has a really interesting theory in his book, The Mating Mind, that I think the basic argument is, again, because chimps survived millions of years, our ape-like ancestors, and they still survive. It might not be that you need human level intelligence to survive. It might have been sexual selection that for getting smarter each generation. Yeah. So this is the huge unanswered question looming over evolutionary anthropology. Everything alive today, that lineage made it through the Pleistocene. So we all made it through, uh, chimps made it through, gorillas made it through, mice made it through, lizards and birds and bacteria and everything, plants. Everything alive today made it through the Pleistocene. So all those selection pressures that the human lineage were experiencing, not all of them, but the, the basic same Ice Age environment was also being experienced by every other organism on the planet. And in particular, those that were in the same environments that humans were evolving in were experiencing the same selection pressures. And sexual selection is acting on every sexually reproducing species. Those things in and of themselves don't get us too far. And we still don't really know. And this is the problem that any explanation that you offer is probably going to apply to other species. Why that explanation it happened in humans and not in species X or Y or Z. I would say there's a consensus that 
meat eating played a role of some sort because we see coincident with that expansion of race highs in the fossil record, increasing evidence of use of meat resources. We see stone tools appearing around this time. We begin to see a lot of butchering marks on animal bones in close association with those tools and those fossils. And that accelerates as we move through the Pleistocene. The reliance on animal foods seems to be increasing. And meat is a very energy dense resource. It has low toxicity. So if you're eating, if you basically are spending your whole day eating plants, you're <clears throat> You're not eating nice domesticated, low toxin plants. You're not cooking the plants. If you're an herbivore, you're eating a lot of raw plant foods. You're ingesting a lot of plant toxins. And that's going to be interfering with neural development. So it might be just impossible for plant eaters to really evolve, or at least folks, individuals, and species eating large quantities of plants are dealing with a lot of plant toxins. And the energy returns are lower than meat. And as you mentioned, cooking, cooking detoxifies your foods. It sterilizes them. It makes the energy more available. So the increased energy availability from meat and the lower toxicity, what we call a high quality diet, I think there's a consensus that's playing a role somehow, that you couldn't get a big brain without that high energy source. But does that mean you need a big brain? We know there's lots of carnivores whose brains are a lot smaller than ours. They're relying heavily on meat. So that's probably not enough to get there. Now, could sexual selection have played a role? It could be the kind of sexual selection that Jeffrey Miller is talking about, where you're trying to remember, uh, impress members of the opposite sex. But there's another kind of sexual selection, which is interactions with the same sex. And this is one of the areas that we've been exploring recently. Could there have been a form of sexual selection, but on traits that are also evaluated by members of the same sex? When we look in small-scale societies today that we think might at least give us some clues about ancestral societies, what we see is that some men have more influence on the group than others. We call them leaders, but they might be called big men or, and it doesn't mean they have any formal authority to tell people what to do, but when they talk, other people tend to listen. And what we also see associated with that is that these men tend to be polygynous. They tend to have multiple wives and they tend to have more kids than others. So we've been pursuing the idea there's something about the role of leaders and men and reproduction is playing a role in brain expansion. This idea was put forward by geneticist James Neal back in the 1960s and 70s. It really wasn't followed up on, but we're dusting off this old idea, uh, looking at could, the, could leadership have been cognitively demanding so that to rise to the position of leader, you really need other men to uh, endorse you as leader. So this isn't, you're not trying to impress women, you're trying to impress either men with your decision-making abilities and your hunting abilities and your fighting abilities and your cultural competencies. And so could there have been some dynamic where those men that were best able to convince other men to put their feeds in their hands as leaders of the group or as influential voices was one of the important selection pressures leading to the increase in brain size. Again, it's pretty speculative, but so are all the other theories. So, so to be a leader, you needed to be smarter than average. And then a side effect of being that leader meant having more offspring than that would just gradually pull us towards the higher intelligence gene pool. Exactly. A related point is that most innovation seems to happen from that very upper end of the distribution, right? We say as it, humanity collectively, we've landed on the, mu the moon, we put satellites in space, we have internet and all these cool gadgets, but it's really 1% of the population or less of super smart engineers that did all that. And most people, maybe even if they spent years trying, wouldn't be able to. And I'm wondering if over evolutionary history, if you have the same things, the level of brain power that we have now at the upper end of the distribution, it seems has never existed before at any other well, we are, history. Yeah. We're in huge populations, so we can take uh -huh. advantage of when you have six, seven, eight billion people on the planet, the upper 
tenth of a percentile of talents in any area, whatever those might be, music or art or storytelling or literature or science or engineering, you're going to have a lot more just in absolute numbers of those folks. So large populations, and that's actually give us an advantage. You have more talented people, and then you also have a kind of a bigger capacity. A lot of the folks working on cultural evolution have really been exploring this idea that you also can have more diversity of ideas to select from in these large populations. So there might be some synergy there with exceptionally talented people having access to an exceptionally diverse library of options and ideas to work with. Yeah. I don't know if you ever play around with these weird hypotheticals, but I think sometimes I'm not going to use the example of Neanderthal because I think they were much smarter than we realized. But say if you took the genius level Homo erectus and placed them in our society, would they be equivalent to something like an average Homo sapien, even if average Homo erectus wasn't at our level? Another thing you could do a set of evolutionary comparison is something like comparisons between adults and children. Like a genius level child might have the same cognitive power as the average adult human. Yeah, that one's a tough one. Someday we may get some handles on this because we are getting genomes from these the ever more ancient ancestors. And we are slowly beginning to Chill in the genotype, phenotype map, how genotypes create phenotypes. And we're nowhere close to being able to do that yet. But it's not out of the realm of possibility that we may be able to get a genome of one of these more ancient folks. And we're already pushing it back close to about a million years back. Um, so that's making some progress. And we might be able to answer those questions. I think right now we cannot answer those questions. There is some intriguing evidence with Homo naledi, which is a new hominin, new member of our genus Homo, found in South African cave, that has uh, a small brain about the size of a rectus, but surviving, persisting, up until the point that modern humans appear on the scene some 200 plus thousand years ago in Africa, uh, maybe even overlapping. And there's at least some claims, still pretty controversial, but because these fossils were found deep in a cave where you really couldn't get to without some form of light, i.e. fire, and why would you even be going there in the first place? And then why are so many bodies in there? Could it have been some sort of deliberate burial? Could there be, have been ritual involved here with a seemingly pretty primitive member of our genus? raising the possibility that their cognitive abilities were uh, more advanced than we might give them credit for. Now, those, all those claims are pretty controversial at this point, but it's a new possibility, set of possibilities that have been opened up by these recent discoveries. What is it that earned them the title of new species? I know sometimes in anthropology, there are these controversies about, did you really discover a new species or did you discover like a new population of an existing species that is just different in some subtle ways and it's arbitrary what you call a species distinction? Yeah, that's a great question. Honestly, I'm not uh, as familiar with the fossil evidence that would distinguish, let's say, Naledi from Homo or Gaster. The time periods and locations are really different. So we're in South Africa, uh, in a South African cave at about 250 plus thousand years ago. Whereas if we look for something like Homo erectus or Homo ergaster, we're back at 1.5 million years ago in Africa or Eurasia. So that is playing into the decision here. But there are undoubtedly more subtle aspects of the fossil morphology and the dentition. Um, and cranium. And, and that's one of the advantages of these fossil finds is that we've got a, usually you find a tooth. And then if you're lucky, you might have part of the cranium. But here we have a lot of different skeletal elements. And putting those all together, let the discoverers, and I think this is widely accepted in paleoanthropology. I'm not a paleoanthropologist, but I haven't really seen any disputes with the designation of this as a new and distinct species, given the entirety of the morphological differences in the skeletal materials that have been recovered. Another way of defining species that's more intuitive to me is whether or not 
these animals can reproduce with each other. But sometimes you get species like tigers and lions or like humans and Neanderthals that we do know can mate or do mate sometimes. Yeah, so hybridization is pretty common. And so this, the, what you mentioned is known as the biological species concept, which is that we define species by reproductive isolation. So they, the species are organisms that interbreed with each other, but not with other species in nature. And of course, in zoos and other more artificial situations, we can see hybrids that probably don't occur in nature very often. But now that we've had a chance to really look closely at the genomes of a large number of species, not only in primates, but in birds and carnivores, um, we see a lot of evidence of introgression, that there's chunks of the genome that clearly came from a different species. Um, some people would say, does that call into question our species concept? Some people would say yes. A lot of people would say no. Um, yes, it's, we're going to get some what's called horizontal gene transfer. Some genes coming over from other species, but nevertheless, the species concept and the biological species concept is still really useful. And, but Lee Berger, the, one of the main discoverers of Maletti and who's leading that project, told me that he thinks that some of the evidence that we see in human genomes for integration that have not been linked to any other fossil species. So we know. We see Neanderthal DNA coming into the human lineage. We see Denisovan DNA coming into the human lineage. But we also have genetic signatures of what we call ghost populations. Chunks of the genome that seem to have come in from some unknown species that hasn't been linked to any particular fossil, uh, but the genetic signature is there. And I don't know everyone agrees that those genetic patterns really do indicate a ghost species, but they might. Human, the human ancestral humans, folks on our lineage may have interbred with members of this genus Homo that were actually a different species. And Lee Berger said he suspects that there may have been interbreeding between a human lineage and the Letty, you know, the Letty lineage, and that Letty might be one of those those species. Whether anybody else agrees with that, I don't know, but at least that idea is out there. The weird place my brain goes there, similarly to wondering how an early hominid ancestor would fare cognitively in today's society, is yeah, what would happen sexually there? A, if there are different species, but let's say genetically related enough that one could in principle reproduce, would there be motivation to do that on either end? Would they find us attractive? Would we find them attractive? And from an evolutionary scale, like how does, how much consistency is there, say, cross-culturally on what's defined as attractive or what you might predict there. Yeah. And there's actually a lot of research on that in other species. So we're not the only species to have mate preferences. And so there's a lot of research in birds. And in birds, it's, there's a lot of bird species that are very closely related, very morphologically, really similar to each other. And so how do birds know who to mate with? And mate preferences undoubtedly play a really important role here. And there might be sex differences in those. Some males might be more willing to take a gamble uh, because the co they're not going to get pregnant. So the cost to males uh, uh, mating with potentially not of your own species might be less. And even today, not to be too crude about it, but we see human males having sex with all kinds of things that aren't human. <laughs> there's all kinds of, I think there's many reasons to suspect that, that these interspecies matings would have happened. Now, the, the real question is, would it lead to viable offspring if it did happen? And then would those, what would the fertility be of those offspring? And what we see very clear genetic evidence for the Neanderthal genes is that there's been pretty strong selection against Neanderthal genes in the human genome, and in some areas of the genome more so than others. So there are some Neanderthal genetic variants that appear to have been beneficial and that have been retained. And those typically relate to immunity and disease and maybe some to diet and some other kind of really strong environmental selection pressures. But if we look across the genome, it's pretty clear that most Neanderthal genes were selected against. And that's what we would expect to see with these kind of hybrid breedings, that they would work, that offspring would be viable and could produce more offspring themselves. But there would nevertheless have been selection against in the human lineage against Neanderthal genes. And that's what the genetic evidence pretty clearly shows at this point. And that's what we see in other species as well. 
when thinking about the sex different, females would be choosier and more risk averse because of getting pregnant and that, that cross associated with that. And then you might ask, why do males have standards at all ever? Because it, if the cost is so low and you get the free benefit of just spreading your genes more, even if it's not with a particularly desirable partner, you might think men are doing that all the time. Is it, does that mean it's more of a social pressure that men think maybe I don't want to tarnish my reputation. So it's the reputation thing that's indirectly selecting for the. Yeah, I think that's a reasonable hypothesis. So there's a, a huge amount of research on humor, sex and mating preferences. This is not my area, but what you say sounds reasonable. We do see again, even though the same arguments apply to many species that we produce actually even more so because in humans, we do invest. So there is a cost, unlike what we see in many other species. We still see other species engaging in mate choice and mate selection, the males of other species. So there's probably other stuff going on. There's disease transmission, sexually transmitted uh, diseases. There are in humans and even other species. If you're mating, there's kind of competition for mates. You could end up in a big fight uh, that could kill you if you're mating with another individual. Even in species where males are not investing, they still compete heavily, even more so for access to females. So males are going to have to make a decision if the benefits of um, the sexual encounter outweigh the cost. And there's always going to be some costs. They might be social costs. They might be pathogen costs. They might be competitive costs. And in many cases, those costs might be low, but in a lot of other cases, they can be pretty high. Why do you think most men aren't immediately thrilled by the possibility of sperm donation? Yeah, I think sperm donation is a modern phenomenon with modern technology. It's not something that was ever possible for our entire evolutionary history. So it probably, in fact, it will certainly, there's no psychological adaptation for donating your sperm. And in fact, to get guys to do it, you got to pay them. Typically men pay for sex, but sperm banks have to pay for sperm. So it means that their men are going to do it if you give them, if they need the money and you're going to pay them to do it. But otherwise, that's a pretty good example for the, the proximate versus ultimate explanations. Like you don't have to consciously recognize that what you're doing has any relevance to reproduction because you give them the obvious example of here, you can have as many offspring as your sperm can handle. And most people won't want to do that. But sex, most people will want to pursue, even if wanting to make sure actively, probably, that you don't reproduce most of the time. Yeah, exactly. And this is the kind of idea of mismatch. That, you know, why, if we didn't want to have kids, we should just stop having sex. It's very easy. And yet, what we do is we pay a lot of money for various kinds of birth control and family planning so that we can continue to have sex without having kids. There's a very clear example of kind of a mismatch where we now have the modern technologies that we are reaching have our cake and eat it too. We can continue to engage in sexual activity without paying any of the costs until and unless we want to pay those costs in many cases. Mm -hmm. Right. Same thing with the junk food and social media and all the dopamine hits we were talking about earlier. Same with all that. One thing I'll make a point here, since you do study dopamine, is we conceptualize dopamine as a recreational drug, even though it's often used as the explanation. So the way you just use it there, the dopamine hit is like the cocaine hit or the tobacco hit or a shot of vodka or whatever, or your, you know, but really these drugs, tobacco, nicotine, cocaine, heroin, they all evolved to disrupt neural signaling. So dopamine is something that our body produces for ourselves to communicate with each other. It's not a drug. It's the opposite of that. And these drugs are compounds that evolved to precisely disrupt uh, molecules like dopamine. So a lot of these plant toxins evolved to disrupt dopamine transmission. So we really should not try and use sort of a metaphor for dopamine, psychoactive drug, when it's really the case that psychoactive drugs evolve precisely to disrupt the functions of neurotransmitters like dopamine. They're really two different sides of a, of a coin here. And the drug metaphor for dopamine is really misplaced in my opinion. What about drugs like psychedelics? Clearly, 
they're having toxic effects on our brain that gives you the hallucinations and all the reasons that people use them. Is there any evidence that people intentionally use those for some sort of adaptive benefit? One of the very first studies, even before I got into this, looked at the psychedelics that were commonly used in Amazonian groups and found that they, coincidentally or not, were pretty toxic to intestinal worms. So that study proposed that the use of those psychedelics had culturally evolved to as essentially self-medication against worms. Now, do we know that's actually why they're used? No. But is that, I think, a reasonable hypothesis on the table? It's interesting because psychedelics are, are unlike tobacco, that they're used in a much more restricted way. We don't see people typically, and there are, of course, are exceptions, but they're not tripping on LSD every day. It's something that you do occasionally. So psychedelic use seems to be more occasional. It might be that in the cases of psychedelics, that the toxic effects can often be pretty bad. You're vomiting, you're throwing up, you're having really severe hallucinations, you're having a bad trip, you're getting paranoid. So we might be a lot more cautious about how we use them than we are when we use something like coffee. Because the negative effects are so much stronger, or could it be something like a detox to the system that actually lasts weeks or months? And you would, if you're using it for purposes of killing pathogens, you wouldn't need to do that until whatever that reset is. Yeah, and I think that's also a reasonable hypothesis because you are taking large quantities of these and really hitting your system with a big dose and they are quite toxic. It might be that you don't need to take them as frequently as you would your caffeine dose or your nicotine dose, yeah. We talked about a few theories of intelligence. Now we just mentioned psychedelics. I want to ask you about this stoned ape hypothesis. I'm not putting it forward as a serious scientific take, but some people talk about it find it interesting. At the very least, maybe as a psychologist, we could speculate. What is it that people find attractive about this theory? So there's a few out there. So remind me particularly which one you're talking about, because there's a couple different ideas out there. I don't know the details, actually. I've only just heard the idea that, okay, we know that millions of years ago, our brains were much smaller. And we know that maybe our ancestors at some point in our evolutionary history were eating these psychedelics. And maybe the changes that ha- that brings on to your brain could have contributed to developing the high level social intelligence we have now in the bigger brains. Yeah. Yeah. Color me skeptical. I guess it would be something like a necessary, but not sufficient thing. So similar for the energy costs we talked about earlier, getting extra calories from meat eating without that your brain could never grow. But then similarly, without some extra pressure to make it grow. That couldn't happen. I guess people are proposing this as a a potential mechanism. Keep in mind that all these plant drugs work by mimicking your natural endogenous neurotransmitters. So your body is perfectly capable of producing every, all of the effects that these drugs produce. Because what they typically do is either increase or decrease neurotransmission. And your body is perfectly capable, or your body, our species is perfectly capable of evolving different levels of neurotransmitters, different effects of those neurotransmitters, without all the attendant costs of having to go find a plant or fungus that may or may not exist in your environment, processing it correctly, consuming it, dealing with all the toxic compound effects, learning how to use it. So that pathway strikes me as incredibly implausible way to have any sort of adaptive changes in neural function or neural organization. It's just incredibly inefficient. And there are so many byproducts and side effects that I just, I don't see any plausible pathway for that to occur. So it sounds like the connection between the thought of what psychedelics do to the brain and what happened during brain evolution, analogous to the theory that maybe quantum mechanics is involved in consciousness because consciousness is this weird thing we don't understand and quantum mechanics is this weird thing we don't understand and it's hey you piece them together and suddenly you have a new wacky theory right i actually take the quantum mechanics theory more serious than i did the other one and and partly because roger penrose who's one of the world's leading physicists uh, and a nobel prize winner in physics 
thinks that there might be some connection between quantum, quantum mechanics and human cognition. And if anybody knows more about quantum mechanics than I do, it's certainly him. So the uh-huh. fact that he takes this seriously and has written several books on it and papers and regularly gives talks on it, he sees that, and, and I can sketch his theory, I think, a tiny bit here, that if we just look at our standard physics and our standard model of physics, it's what we call a computational model. And even quantum mechanics is computational. So what, what Penrose is suggesting is not even quantum mechanics as we know it, but some future physics that would supersede quantum mechanics. Mm-hmm. And the physics that we have today is, is something you can run on a computer. And it's designed that way. These are all equations that involve values that we can compute and run the computation and see what happens. And for Penrose, he thinks there's something about consciousness and our cognition more generally that isn't captured by that computational model. And yeah, that computational model is perfectly consistent with modern physics. So for Penrose, this is his clue that there's probably something beyond our current understanding of physics. And I would say every single physicist agrees with that latter statement. We know that general relativity or theory of gravity in space-time doesn't jibe with quantum mechanics, which is our theory of the microscopic, of fundamental particles and the other forces. And nobody's been able to reconcile these two theories yet. And so for Penrose, I think he's betting on the synthesis of general relativity and quantum mechanics. That synthesis will give us some insight into a world beyond the computational world that we have today that might eliminate what it means to be a conscious thinking, rational using, decision-making human. There's a computational theory of consciousness called active inference by Carl Friston, the world's most cited neuroscientist. And I don't think he goes down to the quantum level, but he is that fundamentally all cognition is computational. And when you model prediction error, you can quantify that in terms of entropy. And he's using all of these fundamental physics equations and mapping it on to human cognition in a way that's very interesting. I wonder if there's a deeper connection. Yeah, his story, of course, on the cognitive revolution was the bet or gamble that human cognition is computation. That's what it is. And the free energy principle and Friston stuff is, is one realization of that computational model. And folks are still digesting it. I think a lot of people are taking it seriously, of course. I think a lot of people would say it's more how it could be that what does it mean to be a uh, self-reproducing entity? How do we even begin to conceptualize that in computational terms into all of the kinds of things that an entity to reproduce itself and maintain itself in the environment, what does it need to do to maintain itself as a kind of a distinct, recognizable entity or agent. And so I'm certainly no expert on the free energy principle, but um, this is, I've read a few papers on it and this is what I take from it. But it's, it's really one of several thoroughly computational models out there. It's, it's not the only one, but obviously it's getting a lot of press right now. Ed, I love, at least from the perspective of a curious student, that everything about everything. You know, I know you're not an expert on these, but every single- I'm not an expert on anything. Yeah. 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 Thank every, every you. single topic we've hit, you've had. Uh, tremendous insight for me. So it's always great talking with you. Oh, thank you.